Excellent. Greetings, everyone, and thanks so much for taking the time to join us today for what is bound to be an incredible virtual adventure through the country of Papua New Guinea. For those of you joining us for the first time and don't know me, my name is Keith Valentine from Rock Jumper Birding Tours, and together with Nikki Stewart, our Managing Director of Rock Jumper Birding Tours Mauritius, will be your host this evening. If you haven't joined us before, some quick Zoom 101. We love hearing your questions and comments, and for this, please use either the chat feature or the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. Also, just to let you know the given time constraints and the overall volume of people attending, we may not be able to get back to every question posed, but we'll do our level best. So time really does fly, and it feels like just the other day that Stefan Lorenz kicked the series off with Sri Lanka. We're now into our seventh installment, can you believe, this evening? And we would really like to take this opportunity to thank all of you for your support of these webinars. Tonight, however, it's all about Papua New Guinea. This is one of those countries that often sits very high on the wish lists, and for good reason. So many areas still remain untouched, and this part of the world definitely ticks the exotic box in many, many ways. I recall a number of years ago chatting to Rock Jumper's founder, Adam Riley. We were discussing our top countries for birding. In his opinion, Papua New Guinea, or PNG as we like to call it, was the ultimate birding destination. Birds of paradise are simply mind-blowing. And then you add in all the other exotic families and it really is a treasure trove of birding. So our guest speaker today is one of Rock Jumper's most popular and well-traveled guides, Adam Wallane. Adam joined us seven years ago now and has seen well over 8,000 species from all corners of the globe. He started birding at a really young age and has also been involved in research and recovery plans for some of the world's most critically endangered species, such as spoonbilled sandpiper and black robin. Adam guides rock jump on all seven continents, but one of his major loves is New Guinea. Few people have spent as much time exploring this region as Adam, and tonight he's going to share his wealth of experience with all of you. So without further ado, over to you, Adam. Okay, thanks uh, very much, Nikki and Keith, and hello to everybody out there. Um, I'm, uh, I get the honor of talking about some of my favorite birds in the world here, so I hope you enjoy my presentation. Um, please send through any questions you have as we, as we go along. I look forward to, to hearing them. And I've been extremely fortunate uh, over the past decade to spend a, a very good chunk of that exploring the amazing island of New Guinea and have been guiding there for a number of years for Rock Jumper. And uh, it's been my, my pleasure to do that. We've got a long history of, of running birding tours there. And we have excellent relationships with our local guides there. And so we always have uh, some wonderful tours there. Okay, so let's get right to it. And uh, just to put some context in, here, here's the island of New Guinea. Um, so it's down here just north of Australia in the South Pacific, and it's the second largest island in the world. Only uh, Greenland is larger. So zooming in on the island, first of all, you'll notice that it actually looks like a bird. So we're off to a good start here. And this up here is the bird's head or vocal cop. And down here, this is the, the bird's tail. And the defining feature of New Guinea is the central range of mountains that run along the entire spine of New Guinea for about 2,000 kilometers. And this is where the Australian plate is pushing up against the Pacific plate to the north and thrusting these mountains up into the sky. And with peaks up to almost 5,000 meters, they're the highest mountains that we'll see on any island in the world. Okay, now the mountains drain out of some huge river systems, just to point out a couple of them. This is the Fly River here. This is the Fly River, and you see this huge delta where it empties into the ocean. And this is the Sepik River here in the north. But you'll see that most of New Guinea is actually um, lowland rainforest and some hill forest. But it has some of the last largest untouched tropical lowland rainforest anywhere in the world. And so it's one of the three great um, tropical lowland rainforests along with the Congo and the Amazon, okay? So people uh, first arrived to New Guinea, it's thought about 50,000 years ago, island hopping from, from the west, from these Indonesian islands. And most people living in New Guinea today are probably still direct descendants of those original um, arrivals. There was a later arrival of seagoing Austronesian people about 4,000 years ago, um, and those people uh, tend to live along coastal areas and on the islands. But what we have today in New Guinea is the greatest cultural diversity found anywhere in the world. And that uh, fact is best shown by 
that there are 865 languages spoken in Papua New Guinea, 865 different languages. So that's 20% of the world's languages spoken in just one country. Just absolutely amazing. And um, the cultures and customs of each of these tribes is, is quite different and they all have their own um, particular customs. And if you look at the mountains in the background, this, this will give us a clue to why this has developed. Papua New Guinea is just such a rugged place and these intermontane valleys in particular, people just got isolated in them and just everyone just developed their own customs and, and languages. And these are the Huli wigmen. Um, and they actually wear wigs, ceremonial wigs made of human hair, but adorned with uh, all these extravagant bird paradise feathers and parrot feathers. And this is another Highland tribe. You see more bird of paradise feathers in, in, their, in their head. And, um, you know, this just shows that the birds are a really important part of the culture here. There's some cassowary feathers down at the end as well and beating on the kundu drum. And this is down at the Sepik River. Uh, again, we see a totally different um, culture here again, but again, uh, bird feathers are a prominent part of it. Okay, so just quickly looking at the politics of the island. So the island itself is called New Guinea, uh, but there are two countries on the island. That western half is part of Indonesia, and today it's called West Papua. The eastern half of the island is Papua New Guinea itself. So Papua New Guinea is an independent nation, and it gained its independence in 1975 um, from Australia. Okay, and just zooming in on Papua New Guinea itself, you see that eastern half of the island uh, made up of a number of different provinces, but there's more, more to New Guinea as well, which is all these island groups, and there's thousands of small islands in New Guinea. All these islands down here in the bottom, the southeast islands, these very large uh, islands up here, which are the Bismarck Islands, and even uh, Bougainville Island off on the right-hand side of your screen. And that's, um, in other ways, more closely uh, akin to the Solomon Islands. And all these islands have their own endemic birds as well, but in today's talk, I'll be focusing on uh, the mainland of Papua New Guinea itself. And getting to the end of the maps here, this is just a look at, um, to put it in context with the biogeography of New Guinea. So you see it up there just north of Australia, and that's very shallow seas connecting it to Australia. Very shallow seas, and many times in the past, it has actually been connected with Australia, and that greater continent can be called the Sahul continent. If you see over on the left-hand side of your screen, the Sundaic Islands, and um, that's really part of Southeast Asia, biogeographically. And in the middle there, you have Wallachia, the land that uh, Alfred Wallace explored. So three very different biogeographical regions in close proximity, but honing in on New Guinea, it shares its affinities with Australia and the Australasian region. Okay, so let's get to the birds, which is what we're all here for. Um, first off, noting that the island of New Guinea has over 700 species of birds, so that's the most to be found on any island in the world. Okay, but what everybody knows about New Guinea is that it's the land of birds of paradise. And I will be talking a lot more about the birds of paradise in this talk, but for now I'll say there's 39 species of birds of paradise to be found in New Guinea out of the world's 43. So while they're not only found in New Guinea, most of them are only found in New Guinea. And another um, really interesting feature about uh, New Guinea is that it actually has seven endemic families, which is an extraordinary number for an island, okay? So I just put up this picture of the King of Saxony bird of paradise to illustrate a point. So those crazy head wires coming out of its head are actually feathers. Um, and they're the most modified feather that we see in the bird world. And everything in New Guinea just seems to be different and crazy. So why did that come about? So there's a few reasons for that. First of all, New Guinea is the largest tropical island in the world, so that's a good start. Also, there's an, in, a, a notable abundance of fruiting trees and flowering trees, and so there's uh, a lot of food sources available for birds. There's also uh, relatively few predators on the island compared to the continents. And another very important point to take into account is that songbirds, the passerines, are thought now to have evolved in New Guinea or the Australasian region. So you put all of these things together and evolution has been able to do some crazy, uh, some crazy things on the island and produce all sorts of, of oddities. And that's what makes birding in New Guinea such a treat. So the rest of the slideshow will be devoted to, to pictures and looking at the, the birds of New Guinea, but bear these themes in mind as we go through. 
And uh, how I'll sort of survey the birds of New Guinea is look at our birding in paradise tour that we do, show you where we go and some, some of the prominent birds that, that we'll see along the way. Okay, and uh, that is a, an 18 day tour that, uh, that we do several times a year. Okay, so we start out in Port Moresby, which is down here on the Southeast Peninsula, right? That's the capital of, uh, of Papua New Guinea and a large modern city. Really varied habitats in the area. Um, but the dominant one is a uh, eucalyptus savanna. So this part of the country is, is the driest part of the country. And so actually eucalyptus thrive here and it's very reminiscent of Australia. Uh, just as an aside, those mountains in, di in the distance that you see are the Owen Stanley Mountains. And that's where the campaign, the Kokoda campaign was fought. Okay. Um, so we spend a lot, uh, a lot of our early time in the tour birding these eucalyptus forests, which are very productive and birdy. And there we see birds that are mainly also found in, in Australia with its proximity and similar habitats, that's to be expected. So this gorgeous blue-winged kookaburra, a huge raucous kingfisher, rainbow bee eaters are common in the area as they are uh, throughout much of Australia, and Papuan frogmouth. So this is a large nocturnal bird that we normally find roosting during the day. It's very difficult to spot at the roost. You see it's superb camouflage there, but uh, we normally are able to, to spot one and then get, get to appreciate that camouflage. Okay, and one of the specialty birds in uh, this part of, of the country is, is a fawn-breasted bowerbird. And I wanna talk a little bit about bowerbirds because they're one of the most interesting families that, uh, that we have in, in New Guinea and the greater Australasian region. Some of them are really bright. I'll show you one of those at the end. And some of them are drabber like this, but all of the bowerbirds build a structure called a bower. Okay, and this is the bower of the fawn-breasted bowerbird. You see it's a U-shaped structure in this case, and that's the male builds those with individual sticks, and then he lays some green adornments uh, around the bower. Now the bower has nothing to do with the nest. The bower is built by the male as a place to display, display his building prowess, and the female can visit all the bower she wants, and she'll decide um, which one is the best bower, and that's going to be the male that, that she's going to mate with. So it's an extraordinary thing that's happened in the birding world that birds have evolved to build these structures. And it's come about by those features that I mentioned earlier. Passerines have been here for a long, long time, lots of time for strange things to evolve, lots of fruit. So bowerbirds are fruit eating birds. They, it's easy for them to find their food and then they can devote time to doing other weird things uh, like this. And this is, no, this is a different species of bowerbird. This is in the Arfak Mountains, the Arfak bowerbird. And this is the most extraordinary bower of all of them. You probably can't tell the size of that bower, but I could fit my body inside of it. So it's a huge, huge process, huge construction. And then it has all these brightly colored patches of, of offerings that it leaves for the female, which are fungi. And those gray ones in the back are actually beetle carapaces. So uh, absolutely incredible. And this is, driven by sexual selection. So the female's preferences drive this behavior. Okay, now back to the birding in the Port Moresby area. So we also visit some wetlands and we see some widespread Australasian birds like this cone crested jacana and you see those long, long toes that enable it to, to run over the lily pads and some grasslands as well. Grasslands are not especially productive habitats in New Guinea, but they do have some uh, endemic birds in them like this gray-headed mannequin. So these move around in, in roving flocks and they're looking for seeding grass and, uh, and they're light enough that they can land on the tip of the grass stalk and feed on the seed. Okay, so that's just uh, our very quick introduction to Port Moresby and then we head up to Verirata National Park, which is the first national park created in New Guinea. Almost all of New Guinea is privately owned, but this is a national park that we visit and we kick it up to the next level with this bird, the Ragiana bird of paradise. So this is the emblem of Papua New Guinea. This is probably what you're thinking of when you think of New Guinea. And one of our very first mornings, we're gonna go and visit a lack of these guys. And when the females come, they do this unbelievable display, which is like nothing we see in the bird world. So birds of paradise, why birds of paradise? Well, the first specimens of birds of paradise that arrived in Europe didn't have wings and they didn't have legs. And people had obviously just taken them off when they shipped them. But the, the idea started going around that these were birds, that that's what they looked like, and they'd arrived from heaven or from some paradise. And the name has just stuck ever since. 
the truth of the matter is actually probably more interesting. What birds of paradise are, are actually a family of birds that are probably most closely related to crows and they've evolved into some of the most or the most extravagant and mind-blowing birds that we're going to find anywhere in the world. And once we're in New Guinea and we've seen our first lecking bird of paradise, we know we've really arrived. And birds of paradise are able to, um, like with the bowerbirds, again, they're, they're fruit-eating birds and there's so much fruit around that uh, they're able to devote all this extra time to doing these crazy dances. And again, it has to do with all of the fruiting trees, which also support an incredible diversity of doves and pigeons. And here's just five of the species that we can see sometimes in a morning's birding around uh, Verirata. And in a good fruiting fig tree, you can get all of these species in, in the same tree at the same time. So these are not your standard pigeons. These are absolutely stunning birds and look at all the different colors there. So parrots, uh, pigeons are very well represented and parrots are also a very well represented bird group in New Guinea. Um, every morning that we're out birding, there will be flocks of parrots flying around, landing and, and feeding in the trees. And many of them are very bright and colorful like this black cap glory on the left and the female eclectus parrot that you see on the right, okay? But eventually we head into the forest and we look for um, bird flocks inside the forest. There's an excellent trail network at Very Radical. And this is one of the uh, birds that we find in the flocks. It's called the hooded pitahui. The pitahui comes from the, the name of its uh, call. But it's a very special bird because it's poisonous. So yet again, we see very weird things happening with the songbirds in New Guinea. They have the only poisonous songbirds in the world. And the poison in the hooded pitahui is a batrachotoxin. So that is the same toxin that you'll find in the poison dart frogs of South America and Central America. Now they're not born with this toxin, but they get it from eating blister beetles, okay? So you wouldn't even want to touch one of these birds or you'd get, a, you'd get a reaction and you certainly would not want to eat it, okay? And as we wander through the forest, we're looking for all kinds of different uh, songbirds. The white-faced robin on the left, they have this cool habit of sort of clinging on sideways to, to uh, vertical trees. Sooty thicket phantom on the right, that's a very uh, shy understory bird that sometimes pops up. And uh, Verirata and New Guinea in general is, para is a kingfisher paradise. Um, kingfishers are a worldwide group. They're found pretty much all over the world, but they reach their sort of greatest forms and, and diversity in the New Guinea region. And um, most of the kingfishers in New Guinea are not related to water. They're to be found inside the forest away from water and they're feeding on reptiles and things like that. And this is one of our um, most wanted kingfishers to see, the brown-headed paradise kingfisher um, with those long tail feathers that you see at the bottom and the glowing plumage. And we'll, as we wander around uh, at Verirata, we'll see hopefully several species of kingfishers. Yellow-billed kingfisher is usually up high in the canopy. These tiny little Papuan dwarf king, kingfishers zip around. They're only about four inches tall and just glow brilliantly when you get your binoculars on them to this huge hulking rufous-bellied kookaburra. And then as we wander around on the forest trails, we're always dreaming of seeing some of these legendary forest birds, these shy birds. This is another important aspect of birding in New Guinea. It has so many of these shy forest birds that are walking on the ground and very difficult to see. You're never gonna see all of them on one trip or even 10 trips, but they do produce some of the biggest adrenaline rushes on, on the tour when, when, we do, when we are able to encounter something like for example, this pheasant pigeon, which is a huge, colorful, terrestrial ground pigeon. Or for example, forest bittern, which is a, an endemic heron to New Guinea. And it does occur in the streams of Verirata. I don't know how many times I visited there before I finally saw it, but um, I'll never forget the excitement when one of these flushed up and landed on a branch overhead. And one of my great moments of birding in New Guinea. But this is the kind of um, thrills that New Guinea birding can, can produce. As we like to say, expect the unexpected. Okay, so after a couple days in Verirata, um, we've got the flow of things, and now it's time to head up into the highlands. Okay, and we're heading up to the central range here into the mountains. Okay, so this is flying into the highlands. At the bottom of your screen, you see an intermontane valley, and that's an agricultural land. So an agricultural system developed here and has been in use for thousands of years that was completely independent to any other agricultural system in the world and it exists until today and uh, pigs are a key 
portion of that uh, agricultural system. So a lot of the, the valley bottoms are cleared, but the hillsides still, especially the steeper ones, are still cloaked in pristine montane forest. And the very highest peaks, that's Mount Gilloway in the distance, actually have alpine grassland on them. So we find ourselves birding in, in sceneries like this with the tree ferns and pandanus, waterfalls, and pristine montane forest. And uh, we'll stay at a couple different lodges in the highlands. Um, we'll stay at one of the most luxurious lodges in the country. It will either be this one, Rondon Ridge, and you can see all those intricate carvings, or it will be this one, Ambua Lodge, um, which has one of the best views of any lodge in the world, and you get to stay in those uh, really neat huts. And we'll also visit Kuma Lodge, and this will provide one of the real highlights of the tour, which is a bird feeding table that they put huge quantities of fruit out every day, and a whole bunch of forest birds come and, and visit every day. So great observations and great photographic opportunities. And this is a female brown sicklebill, one of several that come to visit every single day. And you notice that very uh, curved bill, and that's, that's used for them probing around looking for fruit in epiphytes or um, uh, pandanus, things like that. But here at the feeding table, they're going for papaya. And what they do, they stab the papaya, and then they fling it in the air and then they catch it and eat it. So that's really fun to watch. And other shy forest birds uh, come, to the, come to the feeding table all the time. These Brems tiger parrots come every day, uh, a bizarre chunky parrot that often is actually seen walking on the ground. Um, common smoky honey eater is probably the most common bird at the feeding table. And they have this cool habit. They've got this bare facial skin that's either bright yellow or bright red and they can change those two colors um, almost immediately, so that's fun to watch. And the gardens around Kuma Lodge are just full of, full of different honey eaters, like this Belford's Melodectes or Grace Street honey eater. And again, a lot of fruiting trees in New Guinea, but also a lot of flowering trees. And so honey eaters are a family that's extremely well represented as they feed on the nectar of all the flowers. And everywhere we go birding in New Guinea, we'll see these curved billed honey eaters um, going for the nectar in the different flowering plants. And another ne nectar feeding bird that comes around in the garden is the Papua Ngoriki. Look at that very long tail coming down to the bottom of your screen there, extraordinary. And uh, you can actually see it using its brush tongue there to get at the nectar of that Schefflera plant. And that's a Schefflera, we're always happy when we find those because that's a favorite um, feeding plant for birds, both for its nectar and then also its fruit. And the lodge is built right inside the cloud forest. So Various shy cloud forest birds actually come right into the lodge clearing like this Rufus Nate bellbird that would be quite tricky to see in the forest, but at the lodge they just kind of hop around on the fences. And we even get a few mammals sometimes at Kumal. Um, there are almost 300 species of mammals at, in New Guinea, but most of them being small and, and nocturnal and elusive. We don't typically see a lot, but sometimes um, these speckled dasters will come to the feeding table and this is a, a, a small little uh, marsupial carnivore, really neat and um, various rodents around as well. This is a moss forest rat that decided to climb up my arm. And still at the feeding table, the other big draw is this other bird of paradise, the ribbon-tailed Scrapia. And you can see it clutching a, a chunk of pineapple there in its claw. And this is extraordinary enough, the, the way this bird looks, but the amazing thing about this bird is its tail. And here we go with a three foot long tail, it, tail streamers, it has the longest tail to body uh, ratio of any bird in the world. And when a, a, a male with a full tail goes flying, that tail ripples and it whooshes. And that, I mean, standing in the cloud forest and seeing that thing fluttering is one of the ultimate birding experiences in the world. Okay, so we're in the highlands and this is really where we see our maximum diversity of form of the birds of paradise. So not only are birds of paradise sort of the most extravagant looking birds in the world. They're also the most diverse family of birds in the world where feathers have done all kinds of different things amongst, amongst all of these quite closely related birds. So we spend almost every morning, uh, early morning, staking out fruiting trees in the area or display areas um, where we're gonna be looking for all these different species. And we normally get to see all of them um, on, on our tours. So this is the blue bird of paradise, one of the most colorful of, of the birds of paradise and it's always it's often number one on people's want list when when we come up to the highlands because they're a localized endemic and they're just such a spectacular looking bird but as we go through these different birds of paradise just remember all of these are actually closely related but they just look so different 
okay? Black sicklebill, you saw a female brown sicklebill earlier. This is what the male looks like. Same curved bill, but with that extremely long tail. And uh, that's him at his song post calling early in the morning. One of the most extraordinary ones is the superb bird of paradise with that turquoise breast shield. And they have a, an amazing display, which unfortunately I've never got to see. Um, but they, they make almost a full black circle um, with those feathers you see on the flank. And then that breast shield and two spots on their head make a giant smiley face. Ribbon-tailed Astrapia is another species. And um, you've seen another Astrapia. This is, this is the ribbon tail with, a, again, very long, incredible tail streamers. And we've already had a look at the King of Saxony, but this is where we see them up in the highlands with those very long head wires. And they feel like plastic when you touch them, but, but they're actually a heavy, heavily modified feather. And in the, in the tops of the intermontane valleys, also the lesser bird of paradise. So we tend to see all of these species um, in quick succession and sometimes even multiple species together in, in fruiting trees. And it's really, I think, the quintessential part of New Guinea birding is getting up in the highlands and seeing all these different bird of paradise. But of equal interest to a lot of species are the endemic families. And as I've mentioned, there are seven endemic families of uh, a, a bird in New Guinea. And uh, here, here they are. So we have the crested berry pecker is one of those from the painted berry pecker family. And you can see it feeding again on the Schefflera plant. This is one of the most amazing birds in New Guinea, the wattled plowbill with those two pink wattles. Only the male has them and, and nobody actually knows what they're really for. So it's probably, again, a weird sexual selection thing going on. Blue captive frit is another monotypic endemic family. Uh, an attractive bird that creeps up and down the trunks like a nuthatch. But if frit means demon, and why do the local people think it's a demon? Well, that's because it's another one of the poisonous birds. Again, eating those blister beetles. And another one of my favorite birds is the crested satin bird. So satin birds used to be thought to have been birds of paradise, but they're now put in their own family. They're fat, chunky, fruit-eating birds and um, not always easy to find, but when you do find them, they just kind of sit around eating on the fruit. And um, spectacular coloration, and I love those two little combs up on his head. I've seen this bird many times, and I'd actually never seen the combs um, until last year, and suddenly this one just stuck them out like some kind of display or something. And this is what happens. You can go back to New Guinea. Every time you go back, you're going to see something different. You expect the unexpected. And that's another picture just showing the striking coloration of the satin bird. And of course, lots of general birding in the highlands and almost everything up there is endemic to the island of New Guinea. So uh, a very high level of endemism, like these great wood swallows that often perch on our lodges. White-shouldered fairy wrens can be found in the gardens. And red-collared myzomelas come to the flowering trees in the gardens as well. So myzomelas, again, are a kind of honey eater. You see that curved bill. So they're a very bright nectar feeding honey eater. And sometimes these red-breasted pygmy parrots come around. These are tiny little parrots. They're only about three or four inches long and they creep up and down the trees. And we can always dream of seeing some very tricky birds like Papuan eagle or, or the harpy eagle of, of New Guinea. And it is related to the harpy eagle of South America. And this is actually the apex predator on the island, uh, but feeds mainly on, on mammals. And then we'll always spend some time walking inside the, the mossy forest. And it, again, this is another essential part of birding in New Guinea. It's an amazing experience. Admittedly, the birding is tricky inside the mossy forest just because it's so thick in there. But when you have a, almost a foot of moss cloaking some of the trees and you're amongst tree ferns, it's just, it's just a wonderful experience. And we spend some time inside the forest. Uh, friendly fantail is one of the birds that often comes to check us out, and they are indeed friendly. And Regent Whistler is a common bird in, in the moss forest and a, and a brilliant one at that. Various robins um, to be found in the understory, like this white-winged robin hopping on the ground, or garnet robin, usually up higher, and that could be a tricky one to find. And um, again, we'll be carefully scanning the forest floor and hoping to find some of these elusive ground birds. Um, Lesser Melampita is a, is a black ground bird. It just hops around on the ground. And it, again, is one of the endemic families of New Guinea. And Poplin Log Runner is a very shy uh, ground bird that, you know, normally we struggle to see it, but this was on a tour a couple of years ago, and this thing just popped up and it wanted to be seen. And stuff like that just happens 
in New Guinea on a regular basis that you just, you can't believe it just happened, but that's one of the appeals of, of birding there. Okay, and then um, after a long day's birding, we do usually go out again at night to look for night birds. Owls like the Papuan Gubak is one that we normally see. Archbold's night jar is a uh, rare highland night jar that we sometimes see. And we'll be looking intently for owlet night jars. Now these are very tricky birds to see, especially at night, they're, they're very tricky to find, but we'll, we always give it a good go. And they're their own family. Um, all but one of the species are, are found in New Guinea. So they're really a New Guinea centered family. But what are they? They're not owls, they're not night jars, they're actually something totally different. They're their own family. And it seems that their closest relatives, believe it or not, are swifts. So go figure that. But this is one of the species that we'll look for in the highlands, the mountain owlet night jar. And this is the larger and more colorful one, the feline owlet night jar. And just check out those whiskers on that thing. Pretty amazing. And while we're in the highlands, there will be opportunities for some cultural uh, visits as well. Uh, this, is, this is the Asaro Mudman, and this is what they do before battle to uh, frighten their enemies away. And uh, I think it would work on me. That's a, a pretty fearsome look right there. And we can interact with the locals as well. And that's Eric Forsyth there hanging out with a couple of Huli Wigmen. And almost without fail, the, uh, the local people of New Guinea are some of the warmest, friendliest people that you're ever going to get to meet in your life. So we get some amazing uh, interactions with folks. And the lodges um, often have lots of insects around them as well, especially after a, a, a night on, on the walls. Um, you can have hundreds of species of moths on the walls, and sometimes the birds are coming to, to pick at them. This is a Hercules moth, and here we have a, a rhinoceros beetle. Okay, so we spend about a week in the, in the highlands, and as I say, it's really, I think, the quintessential birding experience in New Guinea. But all good things come to an end, and we do move on to other things. And so from there, we head uh, right into the center of New Guinea, into this area, and into the foothills, and along the upper part of the Fly River. Okay, so we're heading into the lower elevations now. But we're still in the foothills to start off with, and um, these slopes are very steep, and it's almost unbroken primary forest as far as the eye can see in every, every direction. And we start out with uh, misty mornings, okay? And we're in the area of the Octeti Mine. Uh, it used to be one of the largest mines in the world. And um, there's all these safety warnings around. I just put this picture up. This is, uh, the, the, the signs are in English and pidgin English. So uh, despite, despite the fact that there's 865 languages, most people in New Guinea, um, can, can actually speak English and virtually everybody will, will speak talk pigeon. And um, when, when you hear them talking, sometimes it's difficult to puzzle out what they're saying, but when you see it written down, it often becomes pretty apparent, okay? But we're looking for a, a new set of uh, birds of paradise in this area, like the spectacular, magnificent bird of paradise, again, a very different one, and the Corolla's protea. Now this is not a Corolla's protea, this is actually a Western protea, but I need to show you about the uh, protea. So, these were the ones I had uh, image and videos of. So this has already got to be one of the most spectacular birds in the world. But what it does is almost beyond belief. When it, this was the male, when it hops down on the ground, it transforms into this ballerina and away it goes. And the way those birds can transform, I'll just show you that again. That's, that's what it looks like in the forest. And there it is displaying. And so the way these birds can just transform into something else is one of the most extraordinary feats in the whole avian world. So that's the proteas. And carrying on with the birding, um, we'll be intently scanning some rushing rivers for Salvador's teal, an endemic duck to the island, and the shy torrent lark. And they have a, a piercing call that penetrates above the, the noise of the rushing rapids. So that's usually how we find them. You hear that high piercing call and then, then scan around for them. Okay, and obscure berry peckers in the area. I just put this slide in. You know, it's not the most flash bird by any means, but there are just so many obscure and poorly known birds in New Guinea. Um, and it, it's just one of the really exciting things about birding there is that, you know, this, this bird is just known from a few dots on the map uh, across the island of New Guinea. There's a little group of fruiting trees that we go to. If the berries are on the trees, this bird will be around. If the berries aren't on the trees, who knows where it goes. And there's just all these surprises and mysteries to the New Guinea birding. 
this foothills area is also a stronghold for the Pesquet parrot, which is an ancient lineage of parrots. Check out that dagger-like bill and the extraordinary bright red feathers. And um, we typically stay out until dusk and look for this guy. This is the shovel-billed kookaburra. It's a crepuscular or almost nocturnal kingfisher with that huge honking bill. Okay, and then um, after a couple days in the foothills, uh, we head to the upper fly region around Kiunga. And there we're gonna try and visit a greater bird of paradise, Lek. And this is sort of the classic bird of paradise. So uh, those first specimens that arrived in Europe, they were of this species. And also um, Alfred Wallace, when he came to study the birds of paradise, this was the species that, that he, he came for. And um, so will we. So we'll, we'll visit a lek of these guys and um, we almost always do get to see them displaying. I've seen as many as 15 of these males up in, up in the bare branches of the trees, just going absolutely nuts. And it's, uh, it's one of the, the, the things that will live with you forever. And also in that forest is a king bird of paradise. Again, a very different looking uh, bird of paradise, bright red and white, and one of the smallest birds of paradise. Um, but it is called the king. And I don't know how well you can see it. I'll just put the laser on them. But you see these two little spoons down at the bottom. And those are little uh, coils. And they flick those things up above their head when they're displaying and, and twitch them around. And we do get to see them do that sometimes. But just imagine, again, those are feathers. So the things that birds of paradise can do with feathers is, is just unbelievable. Okay, and sort of the culmination of the trip and, and really my favorite part of it is heading up, up the Fly River and its tributaries by boat. And this is where we get into sort of some of that untouched, pristine, tropical lowland rainforest. And it's a true wilderness area. And uh, we do a lot of our birding by boat there. So early in the morning, we check out the uh, display posts of this guy, the 12 wired bird of paradise. And you can count, I think it has its 12 wires sticking out there. And again, those are uh, actually flank feathers. They're just a shaft of the feather. Um, and so uh, they sit up there almost every morning and, and call for female. And if the female comes around, she'll uh, have a very close look. And he, uh, he actually flicks her in the face with those, um, with those feathers. And if, if she likes what she sees, well, then he's in luck. So that's the 12 wire bird of paradise. But it's just uh, so many other birds to see as we're drifting along the boats. And uh, again, this is a pristine wilderness. Hunting pressure is very low in the area. So we see a lot of the large birds are in abundance there, like pond cockatoo, Bly's hornbill, and many, many more. Lots of raptors as well. This is a, a long-tailed honey buzzard. And eventually we arrive at our uh, humble abode, and this is really, it is my favorite part of the whole trip, is just getting to stay out here. It's obviously um, a very rustic situation, but you are really in the true wilderness now, and that's the view of the front yard. So I'll take that any day. And uh, the, the local guides do an excellent job in there, um, and, and they have built a, a really good trail network in there as well. So we go looking for some of the different songbirds, like this electric blue emperor fairy wren that skulks about low down. And uh, this is Wallace's fairy wren. Quite interesting for a fairy wren is that it's up in the canopy, whereas I think all of the other fairy wrens are always, or almost always down low in cover. But this is usually up in bird flocks, up in the canopy. But it's one of my, my favorite birds in, in New Guinea. And mixed species flocks have all kinds of different things like frilled monarchs. There's a, a male on the left, a female on the right. And um, chestnut-breasted cuckoo. Um, Again, New Guinea has a, a huge diversity of cuckoos, and we might expect that because there are so many different passerines and they've been around for so long. We might expect birds that parasitize uh, songbirds to also be common and diverse, and that is certainly the case in New Guinea. And um, so there's two kinds of forests in the area. There's the non-flooded forest, but then there's the flooded forest, and that's forests that get seasonally flooded by the Fly River um, rising when, when the water is surging out of the mountains. And there's a whole set of birds that are only found in this flooded water. So we go tromping around in there looking for various um, kinds of kingfishers, like this common paradise kingfisher. And we, we look for the poplin pitta um, hopping around on the ground. And maybe the most wanted bird for us to see in the whole area is the Splater's crown pigeon. I mean, what a spectacular pigeon. This has to be the best looking pigeon out there. But not only that, it's also the largest, and these crown pigeons come in at about five pounds, so they're really turkey-sized pigeons. 
And in many places, um, they're very tasty and they have a lot of meat on them. So in many places, they've been heavily hunted, but with a lack of hunting pressure, which is uh, in part due to the fact that we bring birding groups in here. So it's sort of, they're intentionally not hunting them in, in the area. But the lack of hunting pressure in the area means that there's a thriving population of crown pigeons. And um, we always manage to track down these incredible birds. And um, as we're staying right out in the forest, we can go night birding for as long as we want. And um, it is actually challenging night birding in, in the thick forest, but it can be very rewarding as well. We usually get to see this marbled frogmouth. And here's a popwind hawk owl. That's one of the more poorly known owls in New Guinea, but they are around. And uh, of course, we'll try very hard for the two difficult species of owlet nightjar. This is the Wallace's owlet nightjar, named after Alfred Wallace. And um, this is the starry owlet nightjar, which is a really spectacular one. And it's largely only known from this uh, very area here. Okay, and being in such a remote area, there's often lots of other wildlife to see as well. The great flying fox is the uh, largest bat in the world, and they have camps in the area. And uh, on the other end of the spectrum, these tiny little sheep-tailed bats can sometimes be found roosting under big leaves. There's an endemic crocodile in the area that we often see along the waterways called the Papuan or New Guinea crocodile. And we just never know what we might find. And uh, this here, this was on a, a tour we had uh, two years ago, and we saw this tree snake crawling around in the branches. Um, I wasn't sure what it was, so uh, I did some research into it after. I was pretty sure it was, uh, you know, a, a dendrolaceous tree snake, but um, I just couldn't figure out which one. And uh, it appears now that it's actually an undescribed species. So, I mean, you can just literally go walking around in the forest and, and find animals that don't even have a name yet. So that's the kind of place we're in. And um, another uh, really nice aspect of birding in the area is that the locals uh, make some blinds for some of the really shy species. And they do a great job of making the blinds. Um, those, the plant you see in the back there is sago palm. So that's actually what the local people uh, feed on. But these really bizarre, huge flightless rails come around uh, while the people are processing the sago and they feed on, on the leavings. So the locals have it set up where we can stand behind a blind. And if we stand there really quietly and wait, sometimes these, uh, these amazing flightless rails do come around. And the other species that they build a blind for is this one, the flame bowerbird. So it has a fairly simple bower, um, that U-shaped bower again. And you can see just in the back there, you can see the little blueberry that it uses. But this bird, um, it's all about the looks. And this is the male flame bowerbird. It, it's one of the most exceptional birds in the world. This is the brightest bird that I've ever seen anywhere in the world. I mean, when you put your binoculars on this thing, you feel like you're going to be blinded. It's just, it's, it's unreal. And a picture can never actually do the bright, brightness justice. But um, they do set up uh, blinds around the bower, and if the bower is active, we can sit and wait and uh, hope for an encounter like this. And uh, when the female comes, the male does go into this incredible display. So that's, again, one of my favorite birds in New Guinea. And um, with that, I think it's a, it's a great one to end on. And um, so that was a very quick survey of the birds of Papua New Guinea. I hope you enjoyed it. Um, I want to thank a few folks that have come on tours recently with me. Uh, Jacques Gerard, Shailesh Pinto, and Holger Teichman. They've all provided me with a number of images that I've used in this talk, as well as a number of my uh, rock jumper colleagues. So thank you very much. Oh, well, thank you so much, Adam. That was amazing. And the pictures are superb, really great. I've got lots of questions and we've got plenty of time to go through as many of these questions. So thank you everyone that has been sending through to us. So um, yeah, the first one here is, do the bower birds build a structure, um, do they build a structure used for life? No, um, they, they rebuild these structures every year, cer certainly the ones with the U-shaped bowers. I'm not sure on this big RFAC bower bird, but those U-shaped ones, um, they, they rebuild them every year. Oh, well, okay. The huge, and, uh, and they're you, yeah, yeah. Um, uh, yeah, and then is there a particular time of the year that is best to visit PNG? Maybe when there are, are, are more trees fruiting, um, you know, when is the best time to visit PNG for, for birding? Yeah, that's, that's a great question. And, um, and it is very important to go at the right time of year there. 
And so um, you, you really want to go to New Guinea during the dry season. Um, that starts about May, June, and runs through September, October. So the middle part of the year is when you want to go to New Guinea, and that's when we operate all our tours there. Um, that is the time of year when most of the birds of paradise are displaying and have their, have their great feathers on. Um, but equally important, um, you know, Papua New Guinea is a very rugged country and travel can be difficult. And when you start getting torrential rains, it not only can impact birding, but it can impact the travel logistics. And so for those reasons, um, you know, I would strongly recommend going during the, the dry season, which as I say, May to September. Makes sense. And, and do you often see the rail? Oh, the flightless rail, um, do we often see it? It was certainly not every time, um, maybe a little bit less than half. It, it just depends. The, the thing is there are so many great birds to see in those lowland forests that we normally spend an hour or two waiting at the blind uh, for the rail. And if it doesn't come, um, we just have to move on and there's so many other things to look for. Um, but they do come, you know, they actually come to these stations most days. It's just whether we want to or have the time to spend all day waiting for them. Um, this is quite an important one. Um, can you talk about the safety concerns when traveling to PNG? You know, is the country safe in which to travel? You know, there has been intermittent crime and, and, and problems. Uh, what is the current status of these problems and, and how much of a concern is it for, for your trips? Yeah, thanks very much. That, that's, uh, that is a very good question. And certainly uh, New Guinea, Papua New Guinea in particular, does have a reputation for being a, a dangerous place to travel. A lot of that is, is largely uh, unfounded. As, as I did mention in the presentation, almost without fail, um, the local people are absolutely wonderful people, friendly, kind, generous, and we almost have nothing but, but the best experiences with them. But there is, um, there is conflict within New Guinea um, between the tribes. And so, um, you know, you don't want to get mixed up in that. But we have, you know, as I mentioned at the outset, we have excellent relationships with the local people. And this is really important. So you have to know through the local people what's going on at the moment. And, you know, we make decisions based on that. So, for example, recently there were some, some flare-ups in the Ambua region. So, we, we haven't been going there for the last year or two. So, we adjust the itinerary. And occasionally, we even need to adjust the itinerary during the tour itself um, to avoid these situations. But, you know, we put ourselves in the best position to monitor these things. And it's very rare that it will ever affect a tour. But, you know, if it's going to, we're going to know about it and we're going to adjust. So, I, my personal recommendation is that I wouldn't let it put anybody off from traveling to New Guinea. I mean, I, I feel it safer in New Guinea than in several large cities around the world that people travel to all the time. Yeah, um, got great uh, feedback saying the photos are amazing. Uh, a lot of the, all of these photos are from our guides or from clients that have come with, you know, nothing's um, been bought. They're all um, photos that we've taken while on tour. And um, thank you for the comments about the photos are amazing. Um, uh, did you take these photos, um, what camera lenses do you, do you suggest are, are best to take these kind of photos? Okay, um, I'm, not, uh, I, I'm not a great photographer, um, so I'm, I'm definitely not the best person to be answering that question. Um, but I will say, I mean, a lot of those uh, photographs have been taken in sort of dark forest understory situations. Um, and then a lot of the other pictures taken in more open areas will be at longer distance. So I think when, because the birds in New Guinea can be at times quite shy. And so you probably will want a powerful lens when you're birding in open areas, and then you'll want a, a more close up lens uh, in the dark forest. Oh, thanks. Um, are any of the birds endangered or threatened? Yeah, so that's an interesting question. Um, New Guinea is in a very good position in that it, of any country in the world, Papua New Guinea, it has one of the highest rates of sort of untouched forest left standing. And so um, because of that, um, most birds, while they are actually hunted, remain sort of very, very common because there are so many areas that humans can't get to them. There are a few that are, are sort of um, heavily hunted. The, the Pesquet's parrot that I showed earlier, uh, that's one. 
some of the birds of paradise. Um, but I mean, bear in mind, in the 1900s, some years there were 100,000 male birds of paradise being shipped out. Um, and there, you know, there's probably a lot less than that today being killed. But because there is still so much forest there, um, most species are, are in pretty good shape. Now, I mean, the world needs to be careful. The forests are being chipped away at and, and slowly disappearing. And it's one of our last great um, wild wilderness areas in, in the world. And, and um, uh, we need to ensure that it, it stays that way. Yeah, very true. Uh, what is the heat and humidity like? Um, and also, are there any, uh, is there a lot of biting insects? Yeah, so heat and humidity. Um, so about half the trip were at fairly high elevation where um, that's not going to be an issue at all and, and insects probably won't be an issue at all um, either. Um, in fact, it can get a bit cool at night there. You, you, you probably want to have a sweater and, and a cap because it can get to maybe even five degrees Celsius or so uh, at the highest elevations we go. But certainly uh, where we end up the tour there in the upper Fly River, uh, it can be uh, quite hot and very humid, very muggy. And yes, biting insects are prevalent. <laughs> and not just mosquitoes, but also leeches. And um, so you need to come prepared for that. Um, but yeah, it's just one of the one of the things you have to deal with. It's part of the experience. And uh, what are the physical requirements for PNG? Is it is it quite rigorous? You know, do you get vertical walking? How wet can the trip get? Um, yeah, you know, is it difficult that, hikes? Yeah, yeah that, that is a great question. Um, so Papua New Guinea is a very rugged country, uh, as I've said repeatedly, a very rugged country a lot of really steep mountains and really steep trails. So I think a lot of people uh, have the idea that it's going to be a very challenging tour physically. In fact, the way uh, our tour is set up is really, for the most part, um, quite straightforward. Uh, a lot of our birding is on, on roadsides and, and we go short distances through, through forest trails. I'm not saying we won't do any steep, um, steep forest trails or muddy forest trails. We certainly will, but they're generally um, for pretty short durations that, that, that were in these. So it's a tour that most people um, can, can do. It can be very wet uh, anytime. It can, it can be a downpour anytime. Even though we go in the dry season, uh, we still expect quite a lot of rain, usually in the afternoons. Um, so yeah, uh, umbrellas or, or raincoats are, are definitely recommended. But uh, I mean, I think a lot of people are actually put off from the tour from things they've heard both in terms of safety and also in terms of the difficulty of the tour. But I, I personally, I mean, I, I, I would not put it off for either of those reasons. Uh, are, are the rides long? Are the rides long? Yeah, so um, again, because the country is so rugged, I keep saying that, but because the country is so rugged, there's very few roads in the country. It's, there's almost no roads. So almost all of our travel is, uh, is by airplane between the various sites that I, I discussed. So the roads that there are are usually pretty bad, um, but there's very little driving time. I think the longest drive we're going to do on a tour is about three hours, but most of them are, are a lot shorter. Most days we're, we're actually birding close to our lodges and, and very short rides. Oh. What would be the best field guide um, to buy for this area? Yeah, another great question. Um, so there's two field guides. Uh, the original one, which I think came out in the 70s or maybe the 80s, was uh, Pratt and Beeler. And they've just updated that one about five years ago, uh, the, second, the second edition. And, and that's the one I use. It's, it's, a, it's a phenomenal field guide, and, and I highly recommend that. And then Phil Gregory also has uh, a field guide as well, which is also excellent. Oh, great. Um, and do you need malaria uh, tablets uh, when you go on? Yeah, um, so malaria tablets. Um, it, it is advised, we will be in some areas that, uh, that, that do contain malaria, so it is recommended that, that you would take malaria tablets. Personally, I don't. Um, it's fairly limited exposure, but it, it, it is recommended, yes. Uh, let's see, um, getting to, all right, so we spoke about the mosquitoes. Um, uh, do you get to see, um, let's have a look, uh, do you get to see the birds displaying often? Yeah, quite a bit. So um, some of them we do. So the one, the uh, sort of paradisia ones, like the ragiana, the lesser, and the greater, we tend to see those ones displaying. Um, 
Sometimes we see some of the other ones displaying like the 12 wire and, and the king. Um, but most of the other ones in the highlands, we actually don't. Um, so for example, that Parotia dance, we, we aren't going to get to see the Parotia dancing. If you want to see that, we've got a tour in West Papua where they do have blinds built um, as well, magnificent bird of paradise. Um, overall, for those sort of transform, th those uh, ones that transform inside the forest into something different and dance around, uh, our West Papua tour is, is the better option for actually seeing the, the displays. But we do get to see usually about 20 species of birds of paradise. Um, we get to see a few of them displaying, and we normally get to see males of almost all of them um, during during our, our tour. Oh. And, and where do the locals get their feathers to use? Uh, the locals get them from from shooting the birds. Yeah, yeah. So all oh. those all those feathers you see in their in their um, headdresses and in their costumes, so those are all from birds that that they you know somebody has shot them for, specifically for for the feathers and. Um, as, t as time has gone on, um, you know, the local people have made efforts to try and keep the feathers longer and longer so they don't have to, they don't have to kill as many birds. Um, and again, just remember, you know, 100 years ago, there were 100,000 birds of paradise being exported to, to the Western world. So yeah. compared to that, it's probably um, relatively smaller. Yeah. How, how rugged are, are the lodging accommodations? Yeah, the, the lodging accommodations are, are, are variable. I showed you pictures of sort of the, the nicest one up, up in the highlands there, and obviously the most basic one down at uh, Kwatu Camp. And uh, mo most of the other ones are, are sort of more standard hotel type, type places like in uh, Port Moresby and, and at uh, Kiunga and, and in the, the Tabubil as well, kind of just standard Western hotel type things. So it's, it's a wide variety. Uh, we only have one night in that, in that really basic Kwatu Camp. But most of it's good, good to excellent standard. A great experience. And how many species uh, does uh, you know do, do you, for a typical tour? How, how many species would you see? Yeah. So uh, on our on our typical tour, we're going to see about uh, three hundred species on our on our eighteen day tour. Um, sometimes a little bit more, and that does include usually about twenty species of, of bird of paradise. Um, I know I just saw a chat coming through about uh, Port uh, Moresby and um, uh, one of our uh, attendees tonight, uh, actually Kerry, mentioned she, she went to visit uh, PNG four years ago. Every village uh, we went to, we were greeted by people wanting to see us and shake our hands. They were extremely welcoming. We even had a chance to attend a wedding in one village in the Highlands. Uh, Port Moresby, not so much. Thanks. Thank you, Kerry, for that. appreciate that, that comment. Um, then uh, let's have a look. We are getting now close to the end. Um, let's see. How do you feel about photographers on, on your tours? While you're obviously birding tours more and more people like to get uh, good photos. Well, a lot of, um, a lot of our guides are, are photographers as well. So we, we do cater for, for both. Um, um, I don't know what you, you have to say on your side there, Adam. Yeah, no, I mean, um, I, I think I'm one of the only uh, rock jumper guys that doesn't normally carry a camera around with me, and, and it's it certainly encouraged um, for, for folks to bring cameras. Um, we do have some, some tours as well that are sort of more, like, dedicated photography tours, but I, I, I don't, I've never, uh, I've never led a tour in, in all my years with rock jumper that weren't at least two, two or three people with uh, long lenses that, that were there as a, one of their main goals was to get good photographs. And it's, you know, it's just a balance. Um, uh, birding and photography are, are, are two different things, but, but there's a, a middle ground and, and we always seem to, to find that middle ground. So photographers are, are definitely encouraged. Now we know, uh, you know, Papua New Guinea isn't a, a, a cheap tour. Um, it's, it's, and maybe you can give an, uh, a reason why, why the, there's extra costs then going. Yeah, well, that, that's an interesting question. Why, why is Papua New Guinea so expensive? And, and I think a, a lot of local people would, uh, would uh, be curious to know the answer to that as well. But uh, essentially um, what's happened in, in Papua New Guinea is that it, it's really a, a mining country and um, the mining operations have driven up prices of, of things like hotels and vehicles and um, 
and so those those are the prices that we have to uh, we we have to work around. I mean, ninety percent of the population is is living sort of subsistence living, yet any of the infrastructure is just absurdly expensive, and and it's because of the the challenges with the terrain. And you know, it, it, as I say, the the mining operations have just driven up prices of those infrastructure. Great. I think uh, that is it. We are on the hour. So thank you very much for all the questions. Uh, and thank you very much, Adam. Wonderful. Thank you, everyone. Excellent. Uh, thanks so much, Adam. That was really absolutely fabulous. And thanks to everybody who stayed so long through the, the Q&A as well. Um, yeah really appreciated all those questions and yeah it was really simply a, a mind-blowing talk adam um yeah uh, it's just just almost almost lost for words um right so next week we're off to uh, magical island of cuba uh, for something just a little bit different flying from one side of the world right across to the other and um, yeah, for such a small place, Cuba's certainly given the world much to ponder over the years. Um, it's had a lot of interesting politics and leaders and alliances and um, all the way across to world famous cigars and rum. Um, but the island's also fabulous for, for birders, um, a real paradise when it comes to, to birding. And uh, yeah, it holds a lot of endemics and, and some real special and range restricted species as well. So. Yeah, join us next week. Rock Jumpers Operations Manager Clayton Byrne is going to be talking about this remarkable island. And um, yeah, from vintage cars to Che Guevara and all of Cuba's wonderful, wonderful birds, this will certainly be a fascinating presentation. Um, also, just a reminder that our webinars are recorded and can be viewed later. And the links will be available within the next 24 to 48 hours. Um, also, just a reminder that these webinars are all being offered free of charge, but should you wish to donate towards our tour leaders, our GoFundMe link is still open and 100% of those proceeds go directly to the guides. So yeah, on that note, thank you again everyone for joining us today and we look forward to seeing you again next week, Wednesday at the same time. Um, yeah, big thanks again, Adam, that was absolutely fantastic and from all of us at Team Rock Jumper, a uh, big thank you to all of you and goodbye.